Hundreds of people killed and detained simply because they were calling for change. 2019 saw Iraqis rise up against their governments only to be fired upon and tear gassed by security forces. I'm Imran Garda and this year's Newsmaker is the wave of deadly protests in Iraq. A UN report released in mid-December found that anti-government protesters across Iraq were being deliberately killed, abducted and arbitrarily detained by what's described as armed entities and unknown third parties. But even though the number of dead and injured rises on an almost daily basis, those angry enough to risk their lives say they're not going to stop until the government is completely overhauled. Adam Pletz takes a look back at how it all began. The protests have not been linked to any party or religious group. In this revolution, we are all one people, not a million different ones. Just one people. No one represents us. Those who go to the parliament wearing suits in order to represent us don't represent us. We don't want parties. If 100 of us die, next time we will be one million. Protesters have directly attacked symbols of the political system. They've set fire to nearly 60 public and political party buildings. But the economy and job prospects are the main point of contention. The World Bank estimates that youth unemployment may be as high as 25%. I have a master's degree, but the government would not even hire me as a street sweeper. All these young people are being treated unfairly. Influential cleric Muqtada Sadr has thrown his weight behind the demonstrators, backing their call for the prime minister's resignation and for new elections. With the pressure building, Will Prime Minister Abdul Mahdi's concessions be enough to satisfy the protesters, or are his days in office numbered? Adam Pletz, The Newsmakers. Although the protesters have the backing of some political and religious heavyweights, including Iraq's top Shia leader, they're mostly leaderless. They're born out of a frustration that rampant corruption, high unemployment, and poor public services still plague the country even two years after the defeat of Daesh. I asked Kadim al-Wa'ili, who was a senior advisor to the US-led coalition against Daesh, if he thought these protests were a long time coming. This one, it's unique because it hasn't been ideologized. There is no ideology behind it. There is no leader behind it. Mm. There is no agenda behind it. It started with basic demand. They want a job. They want to uh, have a, a basic or essential life services. But right now, it's escalating. The demand escalating to change in the regime. Mm. We know the Iraqi governmental system or political system, it's a consensual government. It doesn't mean there is one person you can talk to. There is no one person who who has the full responsibility or who can carry the responsibility. There is a political parties. They bring consensual uh, government and compromise figure to be part of the government and lead that government. Right mm -hmm. now, I feel that the protesters, now they, they pass the, the demand of, okay, we want water or electricity or we need a job. No, we need to change the whole okay. system because right. that system, it's a chaotic system. Right. And it needs to be, for them, they need to have a presidential system just right. like other, other nations, other democratic nations. I see. So Ahmed Rushdie, did it hit that point, if Kadim is correct, where the people can't really be placated? Did it hit that point because 100 people are dead and 6,000 are injured, where they don't really want to negotiate anymore? They're talking about bigger things. They want the whole system to go. Well, honestly speaking, it's, it's uh, not an easy uh, uh, task that you can change the whole system in a way or another. It's, uh, it's built up in 2003, and uh, until now, there is, uh, uh, in a way or another, it's the system that already Iraq uh, uh, maneuvering all those things, all, the, all those machine, uh, mechanical structures that are already in the uh, bureaucratic system of, uh, of the whole state. But the most important thing is that it, was, it is a huge message. Uh, to the government, it's a huge message to the to the parliament. Is that uh, the poor people, actually the poor people, who are uh, uh, didn't manage to have any ideology, didn't manage to have any political agenda, just.
just went to the streets, say, we are fed up. We cannot stand uh, anymore all those uh, difficulties that in our life, especially in the southern governorates and, Salt, and also in Baghdad. In a way or another, uh, I think uh, it's supposed to be the, the, the parliament and also the government, uh, uh, they, they understood really the message. They understood that if it will happen again, it will be disaster for the whole of the state of Iraq. Uh, uh, and at the end, uh, all the demands, it's supposed to be managed by the government as an executive arm of the state. One of my great regrets in the build-up to the show is that I wanted to get somebody on the ground, on the streets, a protester, to ask them, what do you want? What are your grievances? Something that made it hard for us, yes, there's curfew in Baghdad and Nasriya and so on, but also the government's choking the internet, right? So it's hard for us to get hold of people on, on Twitter and elsewhere. Be that as it may, Ali Mamouri, the fact that the government is trying to put a lid on this right now and trying to say, hey, we'll meet with you, we'll talk with you, the prime minister saying, I won't have my bodyguards, I won't have any arms, I'll come and talk to you. Is that going to be enough to take the sting out of this, at least for the time being? Of course not. Uh, look, the protesters mostly are young people under 20 years old. Many of them are teenagers. They are very angry. They are desperate. And they've been participating in the protests since 2011. And each time at the end of protests, they hear the same promises, the same exactly promises. We're going to have 100 days plan and we're going to fix the electricity. We're going to provide you with jobs, we're going to provide you with lands and homes and etc. But nothing happened. This time they are very angry, especially that from the first time the government failed to deal with them respectfully and uh, with wisdom. By November, the death toll had doubled and the number of seriously wounded had skyrocketed. Despite that, the protests only grew in size and intensity as demonstrators remained defiant. Promised reforms did little to quell the anger on the streets, forcing Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi to announce his resignation. But with one big caveat, Haider Abbasi explains. Iraq's people are rising up. Tens of thousands are protesting in major cities. They say their leaders have failed them. We want a total change of government. We don't want the firing of one or two officials and replacing them with another corrupt one. We want the government to be uprooted totally. The rallies began spontaneously. People say they are angry about corruption, unemployment and poor public services. But the demonstrations have been deadly. Since the rallies began, at least 250 people have been killed. Security forces have been firing live ammunition at the crowds. Amnesty International says riot police have also been using military-grade tear gas grenades and firing them at point-blank range. Karbala, a city holy to Shia Muslims, hasn't been spared. Police killed at least 18 protesters there. But the city's governor dismissed the reports as fake news. Iraq's Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi is becoming more isolated and has offered to resign. The president agrees, but with conditions. The Prime Minister had previously agreed to submit his resignation if the political blocs agree on an acceptable replacement in order to adhere to constitutional and legal frameworks that will avoid any constitutional vacuum. Abdel Mahdi has also been abandoned by one of his main supporters in parliament, Muqtada al-Sada. The cleric leads the largest bloc. He was seen joining protesters in the city of Najaf. <laughs> Sadr and his main rival chose Abdel Mahdi as a compromise candidate last year, after they each failed to secure enough votes to form a government. Iraq has been relatively stable since Daesh was defeated there two years ago. But this calm has been shattered. Will replacing the Prime Minister solve Iraq's troubles? And will Abdel Mahdi's resignation placate the protesters? Haider Abbasi, The Newsmakers. The possibility of a new Prime Minister did little to stop a movement that seemed to grow stronger by the day. 
as tear gas mingled with the smell of diesel on Baghdad streets and protests extended well into the evening, the government seemed intent on moving at a pace much slower than protesters wanted. Saad al-Muttalibi has been a member of Baghdad's local government with the ruling State of Law Alliance. When I spoke to him in November, after witnessing more than a month of protests, I asked him if he thought the government was listening to the people. Uh, yes, they are listening, but they're not understanding what the demonstrators are saying. The saying the demonstrators are not complaining of a particular prime minister or a president or even the parliament. Demonstrators are talking about the whole regime, the structure, the political structure in Iraq is at fault. And the population, uh, those who are demonstrating and those who are not, they all agree on one thing that this institution, this political institution is corrupt. This institution need to be replaced. The problem is, which is a very practical problem, how is that could be done? Because uh, uh, you can't uh, uh, remove a prime minister without a replacement. You can't legislate a new uh, uh, election uh, uh, law without a parliament. You can't form uh, a new independent uh, commission for, for the elections without the parliament again. And you can't even vote for a government without the parliament. We are, after all, a parliamentarian system. And I think the people are saying is the parliamentarian system in Iraq has failed. And even today, the jurisprudence in Najaf, the Marjaya, were very clear and said that in a, in a, in a, in a statement, that the people must be allowed to choose the type of regime that suits them. And nobody, and that includes nobody internally or externally, should be allowed to interfere in Iraqi affairs or to uh, hijack right. the Iraqi say or the Iraqi people's decision. So, yes, the, people, the government is listening, but they can't understand the language. Right, and this is very interesting because the parameters seem to be very different here. Uh, Murtaza Faisal, you've been on the street. Just how much of a gap is there between the leadership and the people? Because the leadership is saying, OK, we know you want change, but it has to follow certain <coughs> procedures based on the current social contract that we all have and the laws that we currently have. Will the people ever accept that, or do they want everything chucked out? The, the government doesn't understand this new generation, you know. The generation after, that was born after the, the dictatorship. You know, the, those young kids, they, they never seen Saddam, they never seen uh, all these kind of things. And they are, they are more open-minded and they are more uh, aware about the things that are happening around them. They want, they want uh, normal lives, you know, they want just the simple things. Uh, but the government is not providing them. And they, are, they understood that, the, the protesters understood that the, the, the problem is the system itself, you know, not, not any particular government. By December, Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi was out of office, but unrest on the streets remained. The protesters said they would not stop until there was a complete overhaul of the political system and an end to foreign interference in their country. Now, the largest bloc in parliament, led by Shia cleric Muqtada Sadr, had just two weeks to pick a new premier. But as Natalie Pohonen reports, some doubted whether or not that would bring about the kind of change people wanted. Since early October, calls for political change have been sounding across Iraq. At least 400 people have been killed in anti-government protests. The demonstrators have drawn support from a wide cross-section of society. But it's Iraqi youth who've been front and centre. I want to see work being done. Streets paved, water, electricity, schools, good education and graduates getting positions. All this will be enough for me. The movement is leaderless, but there have been consistent demands for an end to government corruption and politics as usual. And from some quarters, there are also calls to end Iran's influence on Iraqi domestic affairs. After yet more bloodshed, Prime Minister Adil Abdul Mahdi handed in his resignation. The government is now in caretaker mode. 
but it hasn't put an end to the protests. There's a visceral anger against the political system, a system that was set up in the wake of the US invasion in 2003. It allocates power along ethnic and sectarian lines. I want a homeland. I want fair rule. My heart is heavy. You politicians are all thieves and you need to be rooted out. Our demands were amicable. We wanted changes and reforms at first, but now we have discovered fake faces and we don't want any of them. We want to change the entire constitution. But will Iraq's next leader be able to deliver on those demands when what many protesters want is for the entire establishment to be torn down? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. That desire for a complete political overhaul cost hundreds of demonstrators their lives. Almost as soon as the protests began, reports of targeted killings, illegal detentions and abductions were rampant. I spoke to Bilkis Villa, the senior Iraq researcher at Human Rights Watch, about the alleged abuses taking place and who should be held accountable. So it's a really important question to be asking, particularly at, at a time like this. The prime minister, who, who's now resigned, in October, after the first wave uh, of, of, of one week in which we saw 147 people killed, um, he announced that security forces were not allowed to use live ammunition at protests anymore. Since then, we've seen the death toll rise. As you said, we're looking at over 400 who've been killed. And I think the real question is, what is going on with Iraq's commander-in-chief and command-and-control structure? Because clearly, there are security forces across the country who are continuing to use live ammunition, which apparently is against the orders of the prime minister. And that's why we're very concerned that even with a change in prime minister and a change in, in, in cabinet, potentially, that the killings might actually continue. And that's re what really needs to to be investigated. Who is giving the orders to continue to fire on protesters? And, and they are the people that need to be punished. Now, in the initial days and weeks of this, there wasn't a whole lot of attention uh, from, from the world media as to what was going on on the streets of Baghdad and other cities. But now that we see that people are paying attention, are they listening? Does it seem as if the security forces, the state in general, is listening and is conscious of the fact that Human Rights Watch and others are paying attention. You know, on, on the one hand, we, we see public statements from certain parts of the government, uh, from the prime minister, uh, about uh, him not wanting protesters to continue to be killed, uh, about protesters having the right to be out on the streets. And yet, the excessive use of force has continued, uh, you know, de mounting death toll. But then there have been a range of other policies that have cracked down on protesters and the right to free expression. For example, we've seen uh, a continued, almost complete crackdown on the Internet, with it being throttled so slow that, you know, protesters can barely upload photos and videos. They can't access messaging apps without use the use of a VPN. Um, and we've seen government, the government going after medical workers if they share any information about the number of dead, and, uh, and even attacking media stations that are showing footage of the protests. Uh, so, you know, on the, on the one hand, the government has said a few positive statements. Today, they announced that they're going to be uh, prosecuting 43 police who are seen to have been linked to some of the killings. But the broader policies that are allowing for protesters to continue to be targeted are still very much in, in, in place, and the government does doesn't seem willing to, uh, to, to stop with, with those abusive policies. It was hoped that Iraq's new caretaker government would do something to end the violence and specifically the intentional shooting of protesters. But it seems that didn't happen. Instead, the killings and kidnappings continued and grew to include civil rights leaders and journalists. Who gave the orders and who was carrying them out was now the question. I asked human rights lawyer Salah al-Hashimi if he was hopeful someone would be held accountable. Absolutely not. First of all, allow me to offer my sincere condolences to the families and loved ones of those who lost their lives on the streets of Iraq. Um, I, I agree with you in the sense that there is an inherent problem with the entire political system. Hence the reason why the protesters are demanding an uprooting, an entire change 
of this whole system because anything that comes out of a corrupt system will be corrupt itself. And that's why they have rejected it outright. Now, in terms of, the, um, in terms of voting on new laws, we need to ask ourselves, who is voting um, on these laws? Uh, the people who, or, or the members of parliament who are voting on these laws are the very people accused by the protesters of being corrupt and being biased and following sometimes foreign agendas in accordance with their own political blocks. And therefore, nothing good, as, as I would say, would come out of it. Now, in terms of, in terms of the future and in terms of any reform, um, I don't see how you can ask a corrupt body to reform itself. And in terms of changing the prime minister, I totally agree with you in saying that this was merely a cosmetic or a symbolic change. It fueled, it fueled the protesters on the streets that for the first time since 2003, they were able to at least, even if it was cosmetic or if it was symbolic, to change something within the government of Iraq. Saad al-Mutalibi, if we can accept and determine that the protesters are saying, hey, we didn't just want the prime minister to go, we want the whole system to be overhauled. That includes people such as yourself. It includes all of you. They, they want everybody out. Do you accept that? Yes, I'm really faced with a dilemma here. Um, I have to agree with both gentlemen. Uh, in a way, we need a prime minister, a caretaker government. And on the other hand, we, the protesters, don't believe in the present system. But we do have to have a solution to this. We cannot have no government. We cannot have no parliament. After all, this parliament was uh, elected by the people. Maybe the, uh, the numbers were very low, but uh, that's Halal's democracy. You can't force people to vote. Uh, people did not come out. And those who came selected their representatives, and hence we do have a parliament, a legitimate parliament with a working system. Now, calling it corrupt requires evidence, as anybody could call anybody corrupt. You don't but believe it's corrupt? evidence, that's just an allegation. Well, of course there are elements of corruption in the system, but we cannot say everybody is corrupt. That is you know, a generalization which is totally rejected. You can't accuse every person to be corrupt. But as I said, there are elements of corruption. There are elements within the cabinet, which is the, within the executive body, that may be corrupt, but not at the uh, legislative body. The parliament, how can they, they don't have money to, to be corrupt to steal or to, to <laughs> they have projects. <laughs> Salah okay. Hashmi, there's, not enough, there's, there's no money to, to steal. Um, the point is that there are corrupt elements, but this is an unfair tarnishing of all the politicians that they're all corrupt. Address that for me, Salah. I never said uh, the whole parliament was corrupt. I said that there is corruption within, uh, within parliament. So I would agree with your guest um, um, from, from Baghdad. Now, first of all, in terms of, the, um, in terms of members of parliament, I think everybody knows, and it has become common knowledge, that they do benefit from a huge amount of salaries. Those salaries continue well after, by way of, by way of retirement salaries, way after they are, they, they are removed or they are diselected from parliament. And therefore, to suggest that they do not gain any benefit. No, not In true. fact, one not of the um, is a fallacy. It's a fallacy. Um, I think I think the demonstrators have demanded that those benefits are curtailed. Those are their words, not mine. Uh, and therefore, to suggest that they have no benefits at all is, is incorrect. Now, in terms of if, we're, if you are going to talk about the other politicians, I mean, the, the, the projects that have been cancelled or the projects that have not been carried out and that the benefits that have come out of them and have been derived by politicians in Iraq is, is just a case in point. And there are many, many other issues in terms of security contract, in terms of army contract. We can, we, the, the list is endless. So in terms of corruption, I can call it endemic within government government and that's the reason why we have lost so many lives on the streets of Iraq thanks for watching before we go we'll leave you with some of the most striking images from the last few months of protests in Iraq
اريد شعب اريد شعب اريد وطن